Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode number 486, being recorded February 7th, 2018. I'm Alan Momentano. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. <laughs> I'm Josh Walrath. The no speaking gargoyle. And I'm Ken Addison. <laughs> Now, before really we start, itch. I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh-huh. So on the table here, we have three 486 processors. Yep, we yep. have an Intel, we have a TI, and we have a Cyrix. Uh-huh. Josh, you don't have an AMD. What up which, with that? Which one would you be? Which one do you personally identify with? The Cyrix? Uh, I think it's probably the Cyrix. Now, the, the TI DX266. Oh. I didn't even know there was a TI. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. they just licensed it directly from Intel. Need multiple vendors. I mean, I get it. It makes sense. Not yeah. anymore. But. I don't get it anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the one in the middle. Thanks, Alexa. Oh, Jesus. Uh, and then the one in the middle, uh, I have a wonderful view of many bent pins in the back. So apparently Sebastian tried to install that into the... Um, uh, it looks like, what's that? The, the, what? the TI is the less bent? Yeah, 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 yeah. People so. were nicer to the to the TI one, probably yeah. just because it got used less or something. I don't know. I'm just reaching. Anyway, um, welcome to the podcast, you fine folks. Uh, we record this thing every Wednesday night. It usually shows up on the internet Thursday sometime, I guess, right? Uh, do we even use the email anymore? Uh, depends. For official use or... I don't know. There's an email address, podcast at pcper.com. Send I, a bunch of emails. I have to no it. idea. I don't think it's been checked in years. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, we used to have a voicemail where people were calling about papers being delivered to their house, like angry old ladies and stuff. Remember that? That was Lack amazing. Thereof, actually. Yeah, I yeah. I was. didn't get my papers. Yeah. Um, so we so we stopped doing that. Not really sure the purpose of the email anymore because we usually just answer stuff off of comments, off of various things. Uh Speaking of comments, uh, pcpro.com slash podcast is where you'll see our post about this podcast. There'll be comments under there, of course, that we may or may not read. Jim usually comes through and looking for mailbag questions, but those are usually in the, uh, you know, mailbag posts as opposed to the podcast posts. Go figure. I see. I see. Uh, Twitter.com slash Ryan Shrout. If you want to yell at the boss who is not here right now, he is on location somewhere. In Hotel California. Yeah. Such a lack of place. Apparently, they don't have very good Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, yeah. His connection was not uh, satisfactory enough. Not high enough quality for you fine folks watching our podcast, so we told the boss to shove it. Anyway, um, join our spam list. Where is the link for the spam list? There we go. You should know it by now. Sorry, I always had to find the right tab. Uh we have a mailing list for whenever we do live events, including this no. podcast. Yeah. No. Uh, Josh doesn't know about it, and he's saying no he's because we don't let him subscribe. Yeah, we don't let him access this, uh, so you won't get any Josh, uh, JoshTech.com spam or anything like that. Uh, That's the best kind of spam. No I have pictures. Ooh. Really nice pictures. Yeah, the pictures are on JoshTech.com still. I think. I think that might be a video. Oh, it's a video now. Wow. Been upgraded it updates every once in a while <laughs> anyway pcpro.com slash subscribe you give us your name and your email address and uh we just it's just a you know simple mailing list thing to let you guys know before we go to record a thing or stream a thing or whatnot things that might be interesting to watch um next up patreon.com slash pcper is where you can help contribute to enable us to do other extra content on top of what we're already trying to get out the door in the first place, which is already tricky, depending. But um, one of the recent additions was the mailbag. Actually, it's not so recent anymore. It's been a few months now, right? Well, like episode what? 20-something? 25, I believe. Episode 25. It's like half a year. It says 29. Uh, man, that's longer than... Like almost really? a month of podcasts or mailbags. Yeah, speaking of mailbag, here's, uh, here's the February 2nd edition of the mailbag where Ryan answered a bunch of uh, reader questions. You know, things, stuff. Things, stuff, and stuff. Yeah. Um, Guess what? uh, What? I get to do the next one. Oh, God. You get to do it? It's going to be so exciting. Oh, the next mailbag. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, you know, that's good. There was some uh, feedback. Sure. There was some feedback in the comments on the last YouTube video. It was like, hey, why don't we see more of the other guys? Why is it always Ryan and Alan? And to which I first said, but I've only done one. Ego. <laughs> I'd only done like two. Josh, you've done a couple, right? Did, couple. Se did Sebastian yeah, do two one or three? Yet? I don't remember. No, Sebastian hasn't done one. Hasn't done one yet. We need Sebastian to do one live from the basement. Oh, motherboard or uh, oh, case boxes. Cases. Cases. YouTube um, isn't ready for this by itself. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I guess we'll try to spread it around some more. They wanted to like. They were even asking for a mailbag from Jeremy. Good lord! I no. don't understand. <laughs> the hell's wrong with you people? I mean, you're just gonna like talk about the news. All it'd be is just whiskey and smoking. Uh, yeah, basically. And we'd probably like it. Yeah, I would watch that. I mean, you know. Oh, so just leave the webcam on as my uh, carry on my normal day. <laughs> yeah, just just like wear a GoPro on your head and just run around Canada and just like he could bitch about Office through 358. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I would I would love to see a first person view of Jeremy. Oh, no, no, right now I'd have even have my own question which is why in the hell would you redo an office's phone system 19 days before you move the office? Oh, that's awesome. I I, I just I don't understand. That's impressive. So that's my mailbag question to someone. <laughs> hey Jeremy, have you gone out to see Connect the Crow yet? No, not yet. Why not? I don't know. Well, yeah. Okay. It's just <laughs> fine, man. Yeah. Well, let's get into the week. by the dead squirrel in Toronto. <laughs> let's get into the week of the review. Uh, and uh, it's Ken. Oh, it's, no. It's all Ken. <laughs> Ken. Oh, no. With, like, one of the, like, most well-received, based on comments, articles I think I've seen on the site. I don't get, I don't, I don't, I don't get the hate. There's, like, a now. dozen comments, like, thank you for this review. <laughs> It's like, wow, that's so nice. Maybe you should learn from me, Alan. I, I guess. Now I'm going to get all of the vitriol in the world. So Probably. Thanks. Probably. Either that or all those comments are you anonymously. <laughs> he, has, he has a farm <laughs> of anonymous Kens. <laughs> what do you think I do with all those raspberry pies? <laughs> that's what they're all doing. <laughs> oh, figured out your, your evil plan to take over the, the review site. Exactly. All right, so what do you got? So, uh -huh. Ryzen APUs. Uh huh. Those are a thing. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're right. new. There is, it's a well, new thing. Yes. Th these these aren't entirely new. They launched uh, what was it? November of last year, I think. The first product with the Ryzen five twenty five hundred U launched. For those who don't know, this is AMD's attempt at a ultra low wattage processor in line with sort of the. U series from Intel. Weird that they both share a U in the naming scheme. Must be a coincidence. Oh my goodness. So sort of the Ultrabook form factor. However, this has a twist in that it has AMD's Vega graphics integrated. Okay. So what should be significantly higher performance graphics than you get on an Intel Ultrabook, which has UHD graphics 620. They rebranded it from HD graphics to UHD graphics, and I don't think they changed a damn thing. The, the only thing I think... Uh, might change on that, which I, I think I figured out the other day, is I think it can do 4K60 instead of 4K30 out of its HDMI port. I would have thought it could have, uh, maybe not HDMI, maybe they had HDMI 2.0 support, but you could always, I think you could do display port 4K60. I, I guess. Or this. But like, yeah. Anyways. Anyway. So, so it's not full Vega, it's like mobile. Well, Vega, they're, right? they're quote unquote real Vega stream processors. They're just, uh, they don't have HBM or anything like the Cabot Lake G stuff from Intel. This is using the system memory. Oh. So in this case, 8 gigabytes of DDR4 2400 in a dual channel configuration, which is very important. As yes. we've seen with APUs in the past, if you ship them with single channel, single channel memory configurations, the performance really suffers. Yep. So this is sort of the first machine that came out, the HP NVX 360. It's a well-built machine. It's sub $1,000. Well, maybe not. It's right around. It's a little over a thousand, I think. the The price price fluctuates a little bit, and that price that you see in an article is for with that's the, the retail. One, well, okay. that's the pricing for the one with the one terabyte Samsung NVMe SSD. Oh, okay, okay. So, so it, it starts at seven fifty with a hard drive. You can okay. you can pop your own drive in there, no problem. Sure, but it it's on par with the quality that we've seen from the HP Intel based Ultrabooks, essentially. Sure. And that's about all I'm going to say about the machine. We're not taking a look at the machine. We're trying to compare CPU and GPU performance to the rest of the market. Uh -huh. 
Overall, it's sort of a mixed bag. So you see here in Cinebench and Single Thread, it, it keeps in pace with the Intel stuff. We mostly compared it to the the main comparison point is the i5 8250U, which is a true quad core hyper threaded. Uh, I don't know if the i5 is hyper threaded or not. A true quad core processor yeah. that Intel's released recently, the eighth gen parts. You can see in single threaded, it actually keeps in line pretty well. We've always seen decent performance with Ryzen and Cinebench. Then if you go to the multi-threaded test, it wins. Yeah. Which we've That's also good. seen with Ryzen in the past. So no surprises there. Right. However, if you keep looking at other tests, like X264 encoding on the first pass, it's losing dramatically. It's in line with the performance of the i5-7200U, which is the dual-core last-generation Intel Okay. Part, okay. Which is less than ideal. Second pass, However, a little bit second better. pass, which is the more multi-threaded, uh -huh, uh -huh. it's it's winning by a little bit. You can kind of start to yeah, see, see a, a trend here. Yeah, a trend yeah. here. Yeah, single core stuff falls behind. Multi core stuff gets ahead. Yeah, basically, for the most part, there are some oddities. Now, I think if you go down to the Geekbench multi-thread, I don't know. I don't know what happened here. Huh? For some reason, multi-thread performance in Geekbench just doesn't seem to scale correctly on this part. Maybe it was like. Uh, clocking down or something, maybe like it's, the power. It, maybe? It's not a very long benchmark, though. Mm. So Geek I don't bench know. sucks. Well, S seriously, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, this uh, Apple uh, <clears throat> half a watt, one and a half watt uh, CPU is is it the Skylake uh, type IPC performance? Uh, mm. and it's yeah, no. <laughs> uh, Blender, it did decent. Yeah, so so Blender in line with the eighth gen Intel parts. Yeah. So overall, it wins. It, it it wins in some. It loses in some. It's sort of the current tale of the Ryzen desktop processors versus the Intel processors in CPU performance. Okay. Now, if we take a look at gaming, yeah, yeah. which is absolutely sort of the bread and butter for this part. Right. We compared it to the integrated graphics on the i5 as well as the i5 paired with an MX, an NVIDIA MX150, which is their lowest and discrete GPU. Okay. And it, the Ryzen part falls in the middle of the pack. So we see the discrete GPU walk all over everything, as you might expect. Ex except in Doom. <laughs> yeah, what's with the Doom result? Uh, it wouldn't run. Interesting. And we'll get to that later. Okay. So... But if you look, if you take out the discrete GPU as an option from this, the performance from the APU is pretty awesome. I mean, yeah. we could get, if you if you tune your settings, you can get 60 FPS on a lot of less demanding titles. Here we went for kind of higher settings where, where we could just to sort of, we didn't want the discrete GPU to like have frame rates in the hundreds. So we sort of kind of tried to pick some settings that would show decent scaling between stuff. And I mean... Like if if you want to play Rocket League on your Ultrabook, do it. You just, I mean, yeah. Rocket League was running at 1080p high settings, I believe. Whereas that was definitely a struggle on the Intel parts. It wasn't as good of an experience running at around 30. Hmm. What was what was the pricing on the other laptops? Were they all in the 1300 range or? Uh, no. The, the 1300 is weird because we had the one terabyte SSD SKU. That's the one the AMD sent. If you look okay. at they're all about seven eight hundred bucks with more reasonable storage yeah, options, like one hundred twenty eight two fifty gig SSD. Okay, so so they're all in the same ballpark. Yeah, and nothing is wildly different than each other. Okay. All right. Here's kind of the issue. Uh AMD, were you mining Bitcoin on that thing, dude? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. AMD calls this a fifteen watt part. Okay. And um, as we've seen with notebook CPUs, sort of that rating isn't always true because notebook vendors get to tune the processors how they want. It could run at twelve. They could tune it to run at twelve in their thermal in their chassis with their thermal design. They could m maybe run at seventeen, twenty, whatever. Right. However, this is one of the more extreme cases we've seen under full load while gaming or doing. We have a Pavre here, which is a multi-thread CPU benchmark. It's Above 35 watts, the 35 to 40 watts. Yeah. Which is a lot when you're sort of s trying to compare yourself to 15 watt CPUs. Right. So I think one of the things we might look at in the future is, well, how does this compare to an Intel 35 watt part, which are the H series SKUs? Mm -hmm. 
realistically, I don't know how much this matters because if you're going to be doing heavy stuff on your laptop, you're going to be plugged in. So as long as as long as the thermal design of the chassis can take care of it, which it could, yeah, which we had absolutely no problems with thermal thermal throttling on this notebook, right? Does it matter? You're not. You're probably not trying to do this stuff like game or render on battery. So does it really matter that your laptop's drawing 45 watts? Well, I will say that if you tried to do that on battery, like, and it drew what it was supposed to draw, then it would last more than twice as long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the battery. It, yeah, but yeah, I mean, as long as you are at least looking at a review and getting the sure. real number then and you yeah. just walk into the purchase prepared to go okay this actually draws like 40 watts i don't plan on using the battery for anything but like a ups basically if you're yeah. gaming or something yeah, right pretty much then then it's fine so sort of the takeaway here is that this is one specific machine there have been two more that have come out recently i think the acer more targets of 15 watts skew and there's a Lenovo that's somewhere in between the middle between the two of them. So we have to get some more of these notebooks in, do some more testing. Notebooks are just performance can wild can vary so wildly between the same parts because of thermal constraints. It's insane. That's true. It's, it, it, it's it very is, difficult to yeah. make a definitive conclusion about this. Uh, one thing that I meant that we started to mention earlier is software. Yeah. What was the deal? I, with that? As of the time of writing this review and I believe right now, there are no newer drivers have ever been released for this laptop since October, November. Okay. Or, so um, the problems you had during this review are still yeah, there. Like with Doom not running, it's, it's still the state it's in. The community has figured out how to sort of sideload newer drivers from the adrenaline package in oh there. God, we're back to like the NVIDIA thing from back in the day. Yep. Yeah, it, it's not ideal. I want to test it. There have been some people who are saying stability in some games is a little better, performance is a little better. So we're going to try to work on that get a piece on that out just to sort of look at what the software will do. But AMD and HP, AMD and their OEM partners need to work together on this. It's, it's sort of the answer. The chat's just flat out saying like HP doesn't update drivers at all. Yeah, so... And that's a fair a statement because a like they're yeah. really not good at it. AMD right? needs to take the control away from the OEMs like NVIDIA did five or six years ago with their Project Verde drivers was the initiative for notebook drivers, de decoupling it from the vendors, allowing you just go to GeForce.com and download the drivers. Yeah, because back That's then... Worked, it's worked amazingly well. It took them a couple... It, probably a couple of years to get into the flow of things and actually make it work as intended, where you would absolutely just be able to go download the drivers. But yeah. I feel AMD really needs to start to get on this if they're going to be competitive in sort of the notebook gaming space. For those unaware of what Ken's talking about there, there was like like 10 years ago... Or so, is that around the time uh, when you would? It might be longer than that. Yeah, maybe actually. a little longer. Like there, there was like an underground of like you could get this newest version of this INF file that you would add. You would yeah. extract the NVIDIA driver, like whatever the newest NVIDIA driver was, and you would add this INF, and it was basically basically patch it so that it would see all of the other random, uh, you know, OEM yeah. style hardware IDs, like <laughs> hardware IDs, and it worked beautifully. Well, the, the interesting thing with this and sort of the community workarounds is that, like, it's not a, it doesn't need a specific INF. It's installing the adrenaline package. The yeah. installer won't complete because it doesn't find compatible hardware, but you just go into the folder that it extracted when you downloaded the, download the driver and started the install process yeah. and select that and then select RX Vega from the list. And huh. apparently it works. I, I tried it briefly a couple of days ago. I couldn't quite get it to work, but I don't think I was quite on the right versions of things that there was some some tricks with the version numbers yeah that i need to start to figure out but it's that's that's the most disappointing part about this is the lack of software support it's a good part i don't think it will necessarily make them super competitive in ultrabooks today the lenovo design is is a what you would call a thin and light it's a 13 inch machine like about about this form factor sort of thing yeah but that's the only one of those we've seen. We've seen three laptops so far. I don't think they're going to gain a whole lot of traction with this generation, but notebooks are absolutely on a yearly refresh, and I expect a new version of these APUs towards the end of the year, and I think those will be really compelling parts. I won't necessarily go run out and buy one of these until they figure out the driver stuff, until they maybe figure out, oh, yeah, figure out how to handle thermal throttling on these parts that might run a little higher wattage than, because they, they, they have big GPUs in them. Right. So, 
But I would say, especially for something like this, where it's supposed to be, you know, something that you are more likely to be able to game on. Yeah. Uh, you kind of need drivers. Yeah. You, you need drivers. Need, you kind of need Doom to run. I mean, that's kind of like... Yeah, we were very surprised that Doom couldn't run. Actually, one of our test points in this article was the last generation APU, the FX9800P, I believe. Yeah. Which HP released a very similar form factor machine in, so we had both of them side by side. And that worked. Yeah, and it worked. Hmm. So it's kind of like the Vega the Vega mobile variant of the driver wasn't quite ready in all cases. And like Doom is a game you would absolutely expect to run. And we were testing, yeah. we were testing Vulcan in Doom just so it could be prepared for the circumstance, like, okay, this would be a cool point. We can test Vulcan yeah, yeah. on the on the Ryzen plus Vega combination. I think that'll be like a really cool data point. But we we tried a bunch of crap and could not get it to launch. Were you like so you couldn't even get far enough to turn Vulcan on or off? We we couldn't even... we couldn't get into the game. It was crashing in the intro screens. And yeah. That's we did a whole bunch of diagnosing and trying to figure our stuff stuff out, going to indie files and like set the resolution super low to try to launch the game. Still sort of thing. I couldn't couldn't do it. That's uh, unfortunate. I hope they update the driver. Yeah. Mm. Or just AMD takes that crap yeah. over. You know what you know I'm think, thinking about just now is like a like a Nook competitor would be cool with this part in it. Yeah. A little mini PC with these with these Ryzen 5 APUs in them. Just a thought. I'd I'd look at one. That'd yeah. be good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh next up. Intel pushes Xeon to the edge with refreshed Skylake-based Xeon D SOCs. Skylake-based. Well, Xeon D hasn't been updated in a long time. And still hasn't been updated in a long time. <laughs> right? Since they're still on Skylake. Um, what is this? Uh, they updated it to... Uh, added, they added mesh to it. That's interesting that they added mesh. Well, this is the uh, 18 cores. Yeah, it's up to, up to 18, 18 cores. cores. No, I get it. I get it. It's just interesting that you go through the trouble of making it work with the mesh architecture, but you're still on like the Skylake. You know, well, design, I mean, yeah. I mean, right? Skylake X, which is going like goes up to 18 cores on the desktop, is oh, where the true. mesh stuff it was being introduced in the consumer level, I believe. Yeah. yeah so yeah, this yeah. is kind of the natural evolution of that. Okay. Uh, so they're using mesh. They're doing going up to 18 cores. All right. I follow so far. Another page of SKUs. Another page. <laughs> another page of SKU. Yeah. Where's the? Oh, did he break out all the three things? gigahertz? Yeah, yeah, man. There we go. Yeah. There's uh, another page of SKUs to add to your Intel. Uh, if you're if you had a spreadsheet going, uh, so add, an, add another. If you had a spreadsheet going, I'm sorry. Add another uh, like you know. I hit lines. the Excel limit for table for <laughs> the one number cells. Of, <laughs> number of rows and columns yeah. and a, yeah yeah. So th these are SOCs. If, yes. if you don't know, so these are kind of meant for microservers. The home lab guys really like them for setting up and running a bunch of VMs on. They have cool things like four 10 gigabit uh, network ports integrated until network integrated into the into the silicon. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the chip. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's interesting because, like, so that for 10 I, I think gig, it's up to four, depending on what SKU CPU well, the you four, get. The 40, yeah, they the, either have four or they have none. It looked like from right. the SKU list. Actually, there's only one that doesn't have any, and that's the 18 core. All the rest of them have four. And the reason they do the four by 10 is uh, Intel has, like, there is a thing that they push that's a 40 gigabit link. Yeah, exactly. That you know, you break it up into four channels, and each channel is a 10 gigabit link, basically. Yeah. Um, so if you think about, like, even, like, th these are cool in data centers where you can pack in a lot for density for virtualized stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. But these are also can be super cool for, and Xeon D has seen, seen a lot of success in the past for home users. Think about building a NAS out of one of these. Right. Like, you can, the eight-core lowest-end processor has a recommended customer pricing of 500 bucks, albeit expensive, but it's an SOC. Like you maybe put in into a five to seven hundred dollar bare bones, add some storage in it. And you could have like a really, really rocking fast network. What are you looking at for like a board that you plug that into? Uh, Does it just have to are there I think only you generally buy boards? bare bones? Okay. You, can, you can buy boards that well they're I think they should be soldered on, wouldn't it? I don't know. I think they're probably soldered on. No. Okay. Yeah, I was, was going to ask if these, these if these were socketed or if they were. So this, is, this will just I come on remember. something. I, yeah. 
It's not like you get your workstation board and you plug your throw your Xeon in it. It's no, no. I, don't, I don't believe how that works. Okay. You find some bare bones version of this. You, you can buy it. You can buy it on a board. Or you can buy it like in a chassis from Super, Super Micro or someone like that. Okay. I'd imagine it'd be pricey even for like the home home lab crowd, though. Ah, uh, I, I don't. You know, I mean, the the home lab people can be pretty crazy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. like well, they're the, usually the going ability for like to run a, a super fast file server and a couple of VMs got like your Proxmox on a VM and like it. That's true. You, you could quickly fill this up with a lot of useful stuff that people want to learn how to do. And it's, I mean, you, you might, I don't know if you require ECC memory for this. I think you probably do. So that's, that's the other limit. issue. It probably does. I just, just knowing, always, you know. always thought these Xeon D parts are super cool from like a prosumer level. Yeah. For, yeah. Bu- for building cool little small servers that you don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. You can just kind of buy a mostly turnkey solution, put whatever VMware hypervisor, which I'm blanking on the name of. Uh, oh, come on. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, vSphere? ESXi. ESX, oh. Put oh, like ESXi okay. on this, and then yeah. there you go. Screw around with some yeah. VMs. Have some fun. You do pay a little bit for the uh, benefits that you get from these new ones. I mean, honestly, for this sort of device, the TDPs seem high. Like the lowest is a 60 watt, and they go up to 110. Yeah. Which is high. brilliant for a Xeon, but for a Xeon D, you're kind of... You know, you try to pack them into a really small space, and that's a bit high, but you do get a lot of benefit from it. Yeah. So uh, the elephant in the room here, I'm guessing uh, Spectre and Meltdown. Oh, and yeah. All that stuff. Oh, yeah. oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so the perfect use case for this being VMs might actually kind of suck when talking to storage devices. Yeah. Just saying. Remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, these definitely don't have any sort of hardware mitigation in them. I imagine they'll probably ship with firmware patches for this stuff. Yeah. If you're doing random reads, generally, from what we've seen, uh, all it does is increase the CPU usage. It doesn't really hit the performance that badly. Um, it's when you go to do random writes, that's when you see like a 15, 20% cut in like your random write performance, depending on what you're trying to randomly write to. Um, well, yeah, we'll see how. That, you know, pans out later. Hey, speaking of these crazy multi-core CPU thingies, uh, next up's Jeremy's uh, news post on Dell's Epic package. It's, it's pretty big. It's, it's enormous. I like it how really your is. P is lowercase. <laughs> oh, yeah. Always. My P is always lowercase. You like the tail to hang down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. so what's, what's the deal with these things, Jeremy? Well, you've got three models where, and it, well, first off, it's nice to see Epic being sold. Uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah, that's great. Taken a while. So you've got three models, the uh, R415, R7415, and R7425. And as we've sort of seen, Epic's arguably as fast or faster than an equivalent Xeon for significantly less price, which is a lovely thing. And these things are storage beasts. I just like the base model, the, the the one you R7415, you can put two dozen SAS or SATA or NVMe drives on the damn thing. So like a dozen well, SAS or SATA and a dozen lanes lanes NVMe. Of, uh, yeah, 120 PCIe lanes, right? plus yeah. all yeah. the built-in SATA yeah. that they combine for SAS. Yeah, that's nice. It's nuts. Yeah, it's huge. I wonder if and, this, I wonder if the storage, at least the NVMe stuff. I hope that works a little bit differently on this architecture than what we've tested on Ryzen so far, because I've had a lot of headaches trying to get NVMe raids uh, performing consistently. You're not gonna use the. You're not gonna. You're not gonna do that with these. What? what? You're not gonna do the NVMe raid stuff. That you might at least to the consumer level. You might these. want a huge like array. Like, it, why have all this storage connectivity? Uh, if you're not I think gonna it'd be the it. wrong way to use it, though. You're gonna yeah. have an application. You're that gonna get a third-party drives, chip to do your raid, or, or you're gonna have a raid controller in there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the the software VROC style stuff just seems to be on for AMD's side seems to be more consumer focused. Yeah. To me, maybe. Okay. But it. We can skip the middle child because, well, most people do. Uh, <laughs> and the higher end one is just ridiculously crazy. So it's two sockets. So you can have a pair of epics in there, up to 32 drives, 
uh, of which 24, uh, but that uh, 24 can be NVMe and up to four terabytes of addressable memory. It, it's just kind of crazy to see that. Uh, yeah, I love it. Well, it's definitely going to uh, put some pressure on Intel to drop the prices of their Xeons. That's for sure. Well, you're seeing at They're the top end, like a $500 price difference. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean we need 30% more CPU power? <laughs> Try to give us a deal on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't apply that meltdown yeah. patch unless you want to lose a bunch of CPU yeah. power. I think this is the sort of the second big vendor that I've seen. HPE yeah. announced one in like December. Yeah. Dell's, Dell's a big win for this. It's huge. So, so are these actually shipping or are these just announced? Probably somewhere in between. If you've got a big enough account with Dell, you <laughs> could probably put in an order for one, but I don't expect you're going to see it on a store anytime soon. Yeah. And there's also a little bit of question because a lot of the, the other two models, they say there's up to two terabytes of storage, but on the spec sheets, it says up to one. So huh. it sort of says, yeah, it's almost ready for prime time, but... Uh, not quite yet. Uh, well, let's see. It's on. It's the at least the low end one is add to cart on Dell's website right now. Ships nice. eleven to fifteen business days. For how much? Uh, Twenty one eighty or so. Oh well, that's is is their base config of the R six four one five. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the seven four two five when it comes out should be about thirty eight hundred bucks for the base one. Is that just one socket populated or uh, base model? Well. Uh, let's yeah, probably see here. Okay. Yeah, I only see one processor mentioned. Well, that's yeah. fifteen hundred dollar difference between the it and the lower model, so maybe. Hmm. That, that's still a pretty good price. We Go gotta buy get, one. Find us. A, <laughs> we gotta get us an Epic base server to play with. Oh, for we sure. Have a, we have a Xeon base server we're gonna, about to play with. Yep. We we need to get. Epic and I want to get my uh, hands the, on it. And the Plex slash NAS oh, server God. is a Threadripper. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of close. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, Intel Vaunt glasses, I assume. Is that what the, that what, that's what the Vaunt is, right? Yeah. Well, no, it's a device that fires laser beams into your eye. Freaking lasers. Directly into your retina. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, it only does it on one side, so that uh, warning is very appropriate. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it is a very low-power laser. Yeah, it's um, be, it's just below a class one, I think, or it's on the low end class one. Yeah, yeah it's I a low end class one. What I find interesting is that it does the thing where it's actually focusing directly on your retina. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. which means it kind of doesn't matter what your vision is. So if the glasses were corrective in nature, because mm -hmm. you were nearsighted or farsighted or whatever, uh, it doesn't really matter because nope. it's a laser, it's coherent light. It's not really gonna care what of your misshapen eyeball or misshapen lens or whatever does to the beam, like it's just going to project yeah. in, in focus. It doesn't have a choice but to be in focus on your retina. Yeah. Um, and supposedly it's, it's very innocuous until you look down and then it sort of brightens up enough that you see it at the bottom of your field of vision. Yeah, because it doesn't, the, the beam doesn't actually, uh, the beam is coming at your retina to the point where, like, it has to make it through the opening in the front of your eye, and the way that the beam is coming in, your eye has to be pointed down for it to actually make it through. Yeah. Yep. So, also pretty cool. So you only see it when you're looking down, which I think is just... And you don't look like a glass hole because you don't have a camera sitting out the front of it. Yeah. Uh, there is that, but I saw the video... I don't know if the video is here or not. I saw a video... From somebody, like, on Verge. You or, could occasionally see the laser. Yeah, you can see a little uh, red... Sure. Like you can see, our like slightly reflecting off of the bottom of the the lens of the, of from your perspective the left lens, yeah, of the person's glasses, um, so you can kind of tell, but you know, just a slight tinge of like locutus of Borg. Going yeah, but on you there. could turn them off and they don't really look bulkier. Like they, right, they, yeah, they're there's... fairly chunky frames, but they don't look chunkier than anything you might buy off the shelf. If, right. Unless you're looking specifically at the temple where the laser projector is mm -hmm. or any like or yeah. and and red, you know, subtle red light is very, very, you know, cyberpunk. It's true. Yeah. Sure, sure. But it was supposed to be blue. Yeah, blue, red. <laughs> eh, ah, eh. Yeah, whatever. So, so let's take a bet. Does Intel ever ship this? No. Mm -hmm. Outside of developers. 
I mean, I don't think they plan on it. No, they they kind of said they plan on it. Uh, it sounded they, they were talking kind of like technology no, developer th- th- platform ish thing. This is supposed to be an end user device. I understand, but their verbiage was kind of like develop. You know, the, the, like, they like the shipping Oculus it to developers this year, like but, the Oculus, like the development kit from them. Yeah, right. I, like yeah. yes, there were some people that bought it. But it wasn't meant to be like this mainstream. No, no, thing. no. But beyond the development kit, they've said, "Oh, they want to be making them." Yeah, like they don't, hmm. they don't want to hand this off to as like open text to someone. Like they may might partner with someone like Oakley or something like that. But I think that the plan is for Intel to have at least some fairly direct role in selling them, which I think will never happen. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Place your bets. We need like a pool back here or something <laughs> to, as these things happen. The fifth of never. Uh, yeah. All right. Next up, um, Toby eye tracking. Speaking of eyeballs and, well, not freaking lasers this time. Hopefully um, not. So Sebastian wrote this up. Uh, he came with us to uh, the Consumer Electronics Show a few weeks back in Vegas. And uh, one of his visits was to the Toby suite where he saw some eye tracking stuff. In this case... Toby is the company that does like the eye tracking cameras on like the bottom of displays and stuff like that. And it's on some laptops and Mm -hmm. it's on a couple of desktop displays, I think. And, you know, it's cool technology. I think Jim wrote something up at one point about it. He tried it out or. Yeah, I think he reviewed a monitor with it built in like a Predator. Uh, So, I mean, you know, it's cool. um, But even cooler uh, application for it is to put the sensors inside a headset for virtual reality and then use that for eye tracking so that you can do the whole foveated rendering or you know the just basically imagine whatever vr type things you could do if the system understood exactly which way you were looking in addition to which way your head was pointing and which way you you know where your hands were pointing with the controllers and whatnot so uh, I don't know if what he saw was doing the foveated rendering or just focusing as far as his, I haven't actually read the article, but his description when we came back from that meeting was that they had like a demo that they flipped on and off, I believe. Oh, the eye tracking effect on or off. Well, like, no, like foveated rendering on and off. Oh, like, really? Oh, okay. oh, foveated rendering has been on this entire demo. Can you, can you tell that like the text on the, on the outsides wasn't very readable and you apparently couldn't? Okay. So apparently they were actually doing foveated rendering, which blows my mind. It does not seem like we're there yet. I mean, it makes sense. Well, Toby's been doing this for a long time. Yeah, it's it's a hard problem to solve in a VR headset. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, the key is you have to have a turnaround time super fast, right? It has to know mm-hmm. that you moved your eye to that new position and be able to re-render whatever it needs to render. You know, uh, yeah. where your where your eye just shifted to, and without you perceiving the previous frame. That was there, which would presumably it's like not- why is this blurry? Now it's sharp. Why yeah, is this exactly. Now it's sharp. You wouldn't want that. Like every time you shifted your gaze to something else, like yeah. so. I mean, I guess you could have. I guess if while your eye was moving to the new position, whatever frame was drawn right then, you might not even perceive. Yeah, because you know it's doing ninety frames per second or higher. I don't know if this one's higher, uh, but from his description, this was a modified Vive, so I doubt they changed the so screen it prob- optics. It at probably all. was ni- ninety. Yeah. Yeah. They were very cagey about like seeing this in anything or sure, anything. Sure. They said they're working with some people and we might see some stuff at like in 2018, but it's probably 2019, which is just disappointing. Yeah. It is interesting how they have the, so there's the infrared emitters, I guess, around. Yep. Around each lens there. It's cool. Oh, I forgot the mouse cursor does not show in our, in our stream thing. <laughs> nope. Oh, well. So, so I've always wondered, if someone has a lazy eye, does it mess with the eye tracking? I mean, I imagine it would Probably. mess with this. Okay. Well, you'd, I, have, I, you'd have one eye focused on whatever it would normally be a lazy eye focused on. Yeah. I imagine you could probably right. fix that in software. Right? You could always fix it in software. You could always, like, prioritize one eye or the other for, like, like you what? just turn on lazy eye mode, and, like, it just <laughs> kind of ignores to, that one. Yeah. You have to tell it which one or whatnot. Yeah. Honestly, Do you think they have a male gaze mode? That it pre-renders everything that you're pretty sure guys would look at. <laughs> I will say there's, I don't think there's a, even in the current generation VR stuff. I don't know of any way to like turn off one of the eyes. 
which would probably be the preference of somebody that was like, you mean turn off one of the eyes, just not electrical not, tape, not yes, I know, just tape over, but like, okay, just because you have a lazy eye doesn't mean you don't see stereoscopically. Well, sure, <laughs> but like you might not want like if your eye, the other eye was, you know, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't have that problem, so I can't really speak to it. But anyway, next up, uh, what do we got? Ripping out cryptocurrency with the uh, 1950x, says Jeremy. Oh yeah, there's that uh, Bitcoin with, with the uh, there's the Bitcoin bounce on why you might not want to. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's been kind of trending down lately. So an article on like, hey, you should buy a CPU and mine with it to help you pay it off might not be the best in just timing. A, just a little slower. Well, but here's the thing. Uh huh. It was using, uh, when he was chugging Moneris full out and getting 2,005 hashes a second, 335 watts at the wall. Okay. Including a That's GPU. Including with a, a 1080 Ti. Or yeah. no, just a 1080, sorry. Yeah, just 1080. That's not bad. No. Like, that's not a huge amount of power being sucked out. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of the other mining rigs, you're going to see northwards of six. I mean, that's that's a decent rate. Now, granted, I mean, the payout kind of varies depending on what the whole cryptocurrency market's doing, but... Latining, falling... That's, I mean, it's, roll, roller coaster. it's been... Yeah, it's been a roller coaster. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that probably works out to, like, what, a six-month, maybe more ROI? I, I don't know. Well, what was no, rates. he says up and running at, at the current rates, which were February 1st, year and a half. Oh, oh that, really? That's for a complete. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, talking about the whole, he's talking about the whole system, though, like probably with the motherboard and everything. Right? I would guess. It's probably up there. He probably took the price of the whole system. Uh, Threadripper is currently 915 Oh, well, yeah, that's pretty pricey for this. No, CPU. I think that might be just the one and a half years for well, either I, way, I mean, just the Threadripper. Either way, if you just always have it doing that when it's idle... You know, whenever you're not sitting at the PC, like it helps. Well, right. The, the yep. more interesting thing is we did a little bit of testing with this on our own Threadripper platform here in the office. And uh, the way Monero works is it needs a lot of L3 cash. So that's the bottleneck you hit first. So yeah. you can only really, you only really max out half of the threads on a, on a 1950X before any more is L3. missing returns. Yeah. So well, you, you can do other stuff. While mining on just that True. CPU, or yeah. you could you could turn it down to a couple less threads if you want to run a game, right? Like you could you could yeah, have it yeah. always going at some level in the background, which is really interesting and not something you think of with GPU mining. I mean, some people will hook up to their internal GPU so they can do that, but that's not a very good solution. I would get a I would uh, pre-plan a little bit if you intended to do that and make sure you had like a maybe a quieter core. With a, with a, a beefier more. one too would probably be a pretty yeah. good idea. Yeah, beefier core. Yeah. Um, just cause you know, the, the, if it's a smaller one or if it's on the smaller side, like the you're just going to hear the fans all the time and yeah. it'll get kind of annoying. So mm. overbuild yourself a little bit on the cooler so it's not so loud, but then yeah, you could totally get away with yeah. it just running all the time. Don't. And he does point out that if you go like a different way, uh, like nice hash, you could yeah. probably make more money. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to run it quieter. Oh, versus just mining Monero. Monero, yeah. On, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think even with nice hash, the CPU would mine, would still be mining Monero. Yeah, Crypto yeah. is the only algorithm for CPU mining. Yeah, the GPU, nice the GPU would be a little be doing whatever. Yeah, a little more profitable, but um, yeah. yeah, your your CPU. There's pretty much only one game in town for CPU yeah. mining right now. So yeah. don't don't go buy a Threadripper thinking you're going to pay it off doing this. But hey, guess what? If you want to justify it, I mean, you yeah. could buy a couple buy a yeah. couple of games maybe. Yeah, well, like. You know, a year and a half, if you're planning this thing to pay itself off in oh. a year and a half, like the market might not even exist a year and a half from now. Or it could be not. worth 10 times what it is. Who the heck knows in this <laughs> thing? But I'm just saying. Or like, both might be true in the same day. Simultaneously, yes. It's, it's, <laughs> yes. It's, it went from its peak to zero in like one day at the end of the, you know. Oh my God, Bitcoin's worth 50000 And now it's worth three. Sell. So, crap, I missed it. It was two bucks. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, next up. Uh, Tim wrote this up. Fluxster launched some budget SSDs in the form of the M8V, which we just happened to get 
one in and Weird. right here, and we gotta we gotta test it. But um, yeah, sixty four layer Toshiba B I C S Bix Flash. Uh, that's that flash memory that they were talking about the CES before last. Everybody was kind of waiting on this flash to come out. Western Digital was waiting on it. Of course, Toshiba was waiting on it because they're the ones <laughs> making it, right? Like it had all these companies just dying to to be able to buy this flash from them. And uh, now it's out and it's shipping and it's starting to show up and stuff. So that's great because, you know, more competition in the in the NAND flash market. Since that's the gig? Uh, well, I mean, it's the, that's the only way you're going to get there is with more competition, right? If you ever had a chance of hitting 10 cents a gig in the... Is this SST 10 cents a gig? No, no, of course not. Uh, you know, Sorry, I had to play. I had no, to no, play Ryan. There. No, you're not. You're not gonna. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get that just yet. Actually, uh, come on, Flexstore, Flexstore. Uh, have you seen how much they charge for their DVD drives? <laughs> that's a captive yeah, market. There's actually, it, Josh. There's actually competition listen, in SSDs. Listen, listen, Josh. That's that point. You know how like when DDR2 got really expensive. <laughs> like I think that's where we're at with the Plexstore DVD drives right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. What was the name of the optical drive company that was the the shit way back in the day? Was that Light On? One it's that could read the still around. It's Plexter slash Light On. Is that what it is? Yeah, it was, yeah. no, it was Plexter. Yeah, well, one of those. They were, could do a three sheep or a four sheep burn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one of them would actually read the the original PSX disc. Uh, yes. Was that the Was that the Light there On? Was, I'm there was of? like one specific model of like I think that might have <laughs> been the Plexter. Or you're right, though. It could have been like some weird, obscure model of the yeah, light on. Come on, back in the day, the, the 386s, the first CD drives, they always had the uh, the CD caddy. Uh, yeah. It was more stable yeah, yeah, than yeah, the yeah, trays. Yeah. yeah, the good old caddy. I don't even mm -hmm. know what that means. Our buddy Sony and their multi-tray drives. They were so they were so uh, worried about the discs getting scratches on them. Or the Kenwood multi-laser drive. Oh, God. Ken oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times we've mentioned that drive on this podcast? I bought two of them. It's been at least five years since we last That's, mentioned it. can't be right. I bought two of them. I had the SCSI version and the IDE version because I, the reason I went for the second one was because the first one had all these problems that the second one, by the way, also had. It was just slightly not as bad. Like the SCSI version didn't hang the entire system when it screwed up. Like the IDE version did, yeah. Uh, but it's still messed up royally. So, someone in the chat linked a random Amazon listing for a two terabyte Micron 1100 SAT SSD. That's for, like a super budget for three hundred sixty nine ninety eight. That is eighteen cents a gigabyte. That's surprisingly for two good. terabytes. I'm pretty sure that drive is just straight TLC. I believe. Ah, storage, baby. That's true. It don't matter. That's true. Steam and it's game, got two terabytes worth hey, of it. Steam Can't game go that drive, slow. That's a great. Oh, damn, half of it died. <laughs> Seriously, Wait, that, it's still got a terabyte. That is a that is a great Steam game drive right there. You know. Yeah. Just uh, don't try to play the games while other Steam games are downloading <laughs> to the drive. <laughs> Wait, they don't. They don't enable that by default anyway. So you're good. Oh really? Steam doesn't download while you're playing it. No, oh, I didn't know that. No, I've never watched it while playing a game. So you know. Yeah, no, they, they they pause. It's I think it's because it used to be very CPU intensive, but I think they still well, yeah, it's yeah. still pretty CPU intensive. You can yeah. you can like make it, you can force it to, but they don't recommend it at all. I believe uh, when Tim wrote this, they didn't have pricing. Actually, I'm pretty sure I don't have pricing either, and I already have the review unit. I'll have to ask them and see if there's pricing on this M8V. I don't think it's going to be as cheap as that Micron 1100 drive. Uh but you know. All right, next up, also from Tim, uh, MSI launches Radeon RX 580 Armor Mark II. Graphics card. This cooler looks awful familiar to me. Yeah, MSI has been going with the similar design. Yeah, that looks like their recently. same. That's like the Armor cooler. Yeah. They have like the, the... I think I have like one of those in white or something. Yeah, the, the TI, the 1080 Ti looks like that, I believe. Yeah. Okay. There's not a whole lot here, but it's interesting to see MSI announce a new graphics card in this climate. Uh, yeah. Like, almost why even bother revising your RX 580 at like, this point? It's probably immediately sold out. Like, yeah. Is this is this a link? Oh, no, that's just a tech power up. I see, like, if this link was to like it on sale somewhere, but presumably it would just be sold out immediately or overpriced presumably right now but um, it's it's nice to see active development on graphics cards sure sure 
there was a lot of this post. Was, there's a lot of interest on the site, like a lot of comments and stuff. It's interesting. Mm. There's no new graphics card news. People got to hold on to something. You know, there's a chance that the miners might not even actually be paying attention to this and just might well, be Well, they're like, just paying attention to what comes up on Newegg. I guess, I guess. I, I had a shred of hope that, like, new model might squeak, squeak through the cracks and some it's people not, might not, be able to... It's not now yet, net, maybe. Uh, like, they haven't added it yet. Right, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. An all-new MSI, crap at mining graphics card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, <laughs> just call it crap at mining. Just call it, like, not Radeon RX 580. <laughs> yeah. Like not a flamethrower. Just make it a yeah. Just make it a typo. Like the, the, RX 850. The, the Radon XR 850. <laughs> Never come up for miners to buy on Google. It's like this little secret bit of knowledge that only the gamers know. Funny, I've heard that was a really good detector for your basement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, one from Jeremy. Windows S is now just an awkward phase which your PC can grow out of. What is this Windows S crap again? So remember Windows S, it's the thing that locks you down so you can only run things out of the Microsoft Store and you can't run uh, 32-bit anything. Okay. Because, you well, know, that's what we look for in a computer, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. But technically sort of secure and, dare I say, very Chrome-like. Technically sort of. I bet it's still Spectre uh, vulnerable. Of course. Same. Uh, I think that you can get that in the Microsoft Store. Oh yeah, yeah, just a, maybe on a, purpose. It's a free download. Actually, <laughs> I don't know if it's Spectre vulnerable because I don't know if you could you can run enough execute, apps execute the code necessary. Yeah, you have to be able to run another thread because in the all all UWP apps are sandboxed. I don't know if that would. I don't know. The sandboxing know. will yeah. not. The, it, the Spectre can get through the sandboxing. I just don't know what the fact. limitation of code on UWP is. Right, that'd be an interesting thing to check. I suppose. Yeah. And the nice thing is that before, I mean, you'd, you'd buy a machine with Windows S, and if you tossed money at them, they were allowed. You were allowed to upgrade. Oh. Or, or, or uh, a lot of a lot of OEMs were offering free upgrades for like a year. Yes, or and the OEM would offer a free one. So now it's become a mode that you can run, and you can turn it off and just get a normal home for free. But if you want Pro, they want about seventy bucks. It's a mode you can run. In other words, so so the theory being like you buy a new five hundred dollar laptop from Acer and you open it up and, it, and it's in Windows ten S mode because they probably got a discount from Microsoft for doing it okay. on their license. Okay, so and then you you try to run something, you get frustrated, and you click the box to upgrade, and it upgrades to Windows ten Home. Okay. But the funny thing that I bought out of this one was uh, over at throughout.com. He did some scan studies and found out that uh, just over 80% of people who bought like a third-party Windows S device that didn't hit that point and turn it off within the first week just stuck with it. Like they didn't oh, know any better. Yeah. I those, mean, those poor people. I mean, Chromebooks yeah. are a popular segment. And oh, yeah. this is sort of the same thing. It, you, don't, you can't run Chrome because <laughs> Chrome's how you don't feed. Well, so you're stuck with Edge. Yeah. Yeah. I. No, thank you, Windows 10 S. Uh, a funny story, actually. Jim was working on an article, and he he, he installed Windows 10 fresh from a USB drive with just, like, all the SKUs available. And he apparently accidentally installed Windows 10 S and was getting pissed off as to why he couldn't run, like, the graphics driver installer. <laughs> he was like, what is going on? And he eventually figured out, like, oh, I installed S by accident. <laughs> that's That's a bad day. <laughs> So that's just bad. Sorry, Win32, not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next up, uh, Valve supporting AMD's GPU-powered True Audio. Next in latest Steam Audio beta. Steam Audio. Okay, first of all, what is Steam Audio? I don't know. Oh. I think it's like a API that developers can use in-game like in, in Unity and Unreal and stuff like that. I'm not entirely sure what it accomplishes, but it's oh. like a developer package. Okay, so it's not something. something that's like locked into a Steam game. Uh, it's probably just, not. No, it's just a, it can be. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's, it's sure. like anything. You, you, you have to put the code in there and have it supported and make it run. It's not like just, you know, you play a game and you've got an AMD processor and a, a GPU and drivers. It's not going to give you true audio next stuff. I mean, it's it's 
it uses the GPU as a kind of DSP. Well, I think that's a little okay, simplistic, but uh, essentially, yeah, you've got to have you know the support in there, and the game's got to support it, and it's not just plug it in and go. But is it, is uh, this, yeah, so this might be kind of a carry over from like Valve slash Steam's VR stuff. Right, because they're they're big on like the whole positional audio stuff in like VR environments, for for at least the Probably. apps that you know for for the the VR demo style things that they've put out, um, on Steam so far, you know, like the lab and all that other stuff. Um, so yeah, stands to reason they had some development work in that, and maybe they just you know took that and said, hey, let's just make this an API, which makes sense. Yeah, because the original True Audio was such a success. Well, yeah. You know. I Did you ever think we'd hear about True Audio again? I did not. Not really. But this is kind of good because it just utilizes the GPU in a more general way than having, uh, you know, a couple of DSPs in the, uh, what, the... Uh, 290, 390 series, 385. <laughs> Somewhere those, uh, around there. Just make up some more numbers. Level. <laughs> no, it's the 285 and the 380. Sorry. But yeah, those uh, were the last of the hard wired true audio GPUs from AMD. And doing this in a more general way, it's a step backwards because I uh, can't do it as effectively as true audio. But because it utilizes the more general purpose uh, shaders, uh, it's it's maybe not easier to implement, but you can implement it across a larger variety of GPUs. All right. Cool. Uh, next up, actually, last uh, last news thing of the week here. SK Hynix uh, sampling enterprise SSDs with 72 layer, 512 gigabit 3D TLC flash. That's a lot of layers. That's a lot of layers. Uh, actually, SK Hynix already had 72 layer. Uh, they just didn't have it in 512 gigabit. Mm. Um, so the things that flash makers will tend to do is as they go higher in the layers, they'll do an initial round of memory that actually has a lower uh, capacity per die. In other words, they're, the die is actually a smaller square area relative to before for the same capacity. And the sure. reason is because they, they just stacked higher. Yeah. Right? Um, and they do that two reasons. One, like potentially higher yield. Right? You just, you, it's a very complicated thing trying to make high, you know, more layers in the first place. Why try to do that and have even more area of the die all have those crazy high layers? Scale up then out. Not both yes. at the same time. So, so they're scaling up. Well, they actually scale up and narrow it at the same oh, time. Yeah, fair. Right? Because, you know, they're yeah. trying to keep the capacity equivalent. So that's part one. Part two is that uh, the higher capacity per die, you actually end up worse off at lower capacity SSDs because you have fewer dies, and typically each die can only transfer data so quickly mm -hmm. into or out of it, you know, to the to SSD controller. So makes more sense to make the dies smaller and have more channels connected to flash in, in like your lower capacity points for your SSDs. It doesn't apply so much to enterprise SSDs because, you know, they're usually going for crazy high capacities and just enterprise just wants big of everything, yeah. basically. Um, so that's why it makes sense that these are destined for enterprise SSDs because, I mean, each die is 64 gigabytes <laughs> so I mean 128 gig SSD with this thing would be two dies like it, you could fit more than that even in one flash memory package you can almost stack those two dies on top of the controller and just have like one freaking you know it wouldn't make any sense right and the performance wouldn't be great anyway because it's only you're only talking <laughs> to two dies um, so they can only go so quickly but just you know good to see uh, the, the progress marching on and of course they have a wafer in that Shot, so I'm a softie for a, a nice, wafer shot. Nice wafer pick. Nice wafer pick. Well, it's a wafer, I'm pretty sure that's the actual... Um, those are the dies. Well, I would hope. That'd uh, be a bad marketing photo if it wasn't. Well, actually, those might be the... Uh, those might be the 256 gigabit dies Ugh. from last year. Because they look 
pretty small. Anyway. Ah, cool. Cool stuff. Make more bigger flash dies and cheaper and 10 cents a gig there. Yeah. Ryan plug for the podcast completed. Uh, okay. Uh, what do we got? Picks of the week. Is there I don't know. What do we got? Jo- hold on. I got to get Josh. Apparently we got a bra. I got to get Josh's pick of the week. It's, it's, it's a uh, bro. What? I got jo- <laughs> to get Josh's pick of the, the week. The man's pick. here. Bra, bro. Uh, so I recently, uh, this is definitely like not computer stuff, but you know, that's part for the course with me. Yeah. It's um, like, you know, nubbins. So <laughs> yeah. Rubber nubbins. Oh, this nubbins. is just a bigger rubber, rubber nubbin. Nubbins. Um, so I recently, uh, acquired a vehicle that I cared about not chipping the paint on. It was kind of pricey. So like I wanted to, you know, protect the thing. Uh, and I've done like, you know, you get this paint protection film stuff. It's like clear and you put it on and usually you got to go to a shop that knows what the heck they're doing because it's kind of tricky to cut it to the right shape and form it to whatever parts Having of your car. Having watched this happen, seen it happen in real time, it looks like the biggest pain in the ass yeah, in the world. Yeah, it's like an art form to be able to take the raw sheets of it and, and shape it and cut it and you make it You know how bad we all are with using exacto knives to cut exact shapes out? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I personally don't want to take exacto knives to the front of this car that I got, right? So uh, apparently you can... So you use a chainsaw, yeah, right? Yeah, so I use a chainsaw. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I, I called around town and just got some quotes just for like putting uh, this plastic protecting stuff on the front end of a car. It's not right? cheap. No, it's like it's like between a grand and 1500 bucks to do just like the front clip of the car, Yeah. which is insanity. That right? seems a bit pricey. A bunch of scotch tape on there. But the, the raw material is like between three and 400 bucks-ish. Um, it's just like screen protector material. Yes, but you need it to the really right shape. Big sheets. So anybody that's gotten a screen protector for an iPad or an iPhone or your Android phone or whatever, you know you need the right shape, right? And they get the nice pre-cut ones. Imagine if you can get that for your car. You can just order, instead of the, the roll coming just raw, it just came already cut out. <laughs> yeah. And then there's uh, this company, our protection pro company I came across, and they just... Like, these templates are kind of standard. Like, there's software that the the people that do this professionally will use if they have a cutter. Yeah. And they can actually yeah, do so, this. So here's the dirty little secret is that they're just doing this anyways. No yeah. one really shapes it by hand for the most oh, part. Did, did the other guys have, it, like, a template or something? It or was, they... like, half and half. Okay. Like, probably because like, the car was brand new that they were trying to do. and Yeah, like, the template you know, wasn't good in some positions. Like, it just wasn't cut very well in, for some aspects, so they did some of it by hand. But, like, yeah, they, they went to the... Not a laser cutter, like the, just a... Right. It's like, what do you got? You got an A3, right? Yeah. Okay. So A3, all trim levels. Uh, what year is it? 16. 2016. There you go. Oh, watch this site make a fool out of me and not have it. Oh, you got an A3? Wow. It's, oh, wow. There's carbon and stuff, too. I'm just A3. looking for the it's clear It's a Jetta stuff. with a body kit on it. Don't be so impressed. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I went to the wrong section or something, but they usually have clear in all of these shapes, but this is all just pre-cut to fit. Well, no, that's, it's just clear in the description. Oh. That just must be like the backing on it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, it looked like it was carbon or because something. Because if it was clear, would they be able to take a picture of it against a white background? So so these things, <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of just trying to make this stuff fit on the car, right? If you can just get it pre-cut and it's about the co- you know the about the cost you would pay just for the material anyway yeah. if you were doing it yourself see now the problem i have is that's half the battle i've tried putting on screen protectors which are much more much smaller and more manageable and i always get bubbles well just come over and i'll <laughs> i'll just do it cuz i've done stuff like yeah. this before it's cuz he likes to do need, it you need a lot like of, to of like patience soapy water and a spray bottle soapy water patience and heat guns <laughs> basically you yeah. still talking about the bra here yes exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, if you're, you know, there's a lot of car people that like follow the site and send me emails about random stuff, but, uh, you know, if you're a car person, you, yeah, this makes absolute sense. I didn't know you could just like, I figured that software, like those patterns would be very like secretive. Like, I'm sure they like, are secretive. very expensive to get the yeah. pattern access, Yeah, but this company bought them and they're just, yeah, you know, that's cool. Make cutting the patterns and just sending the stuff out. So just, yeah. and you, you got one that shows off your car's cleavage nicely. Uh, you know, it's push up. Mm-hmm. Anyway, 
Yeah, I thought yeah, it was cool. Yeah, you got to get those but headlights like, uh, up a couple of inches to yep. really impress people. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Of course, the car, the sexual innuendo car jokes. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> nope, get it. Good luck explaining uh, the uh, Band-Aid on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> or the fake bullet holes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeremy said, register cleaner my arse in the show notes. So Windows Defender did something good. Oh, they, they're going to... Or, or at least they're going to. They're it's banning, not out yet. They're banning the crapware registry cleaner program? Yes, what? it will How just will, remove the damn thing. What? How will I clean my registry? Uh, no longer will I have to have bizarre uh, discussions in which I can't get upset at a relative about how, no, that thing which you installed that says you have 3,000 out-of-date drivers and 1,500 useless registry entries isn't the thing that made your computer run almost as good as it used to. It's what made it run like shit. <laughs> it's what broke it. Oh, no, but it's a registry cleaner. It's, it's doing a good job. Like, no, no, it's, it's just, it's not. It's horrible. It's cancer. And so it's going to just start without prompting, without any mention whatsoever. Just get rid of the nasty ones. Well, good. This makes me happy, and I can't believe it took this long. I'm so upset. My registry is going to be so bloated now. (laughs) That's its job, Kevin. It's just, yeah. It's way overdue for things like that. Anyway. Uh, next up, George. Um, me? Uh, yes, you. Me, 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 me. What you got? I gotta remember what I got. You don't even remember so, what you got? years Polka. ago, I, uh, bought, uh, a pair of, uh, Polk, uh, monitor type speakers to replace, uh, some that, uh, my wife had blown up and I've been very, very happy and impressed with them. And these are the next generation of them. I know that Polk is not exactly a high-end brand, and people kind of look down on it a little bit. They're usually but good for the money. But their engineering is solid, and yeah. the materials are, again, pretty good. And for a pair, for slightly less than 200 bucks, that's good. they're pretty nice. Yep. Uh, sometimes you can get these on sale for about 150 and like you said, if you sign up for Amazon Prime Awards Visa card, you get 70 bucks off. We're not getting paid for that, by the way. But uh, yeah, uh, they're they're pretty decent and getting shipped from Amazon. They're pretty neutral. Uh, they're not overly boomy. They're not raspy. They're not tinny. It's just a really nice performing speaker for not a whole lot of money. Can't complain with that. Oh, it's good. Put that plug that thing. Some in people the, like pull. Some people hate it. Plug that. But, uh, plug that thing in the camel, 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 and set a watch on it, so you know if it yeah. drops below two hundred, right? Yeah. Sure. Why not? Now let's say maybe you wanted to go a different direction. Uh, okay. I for the past couple of years I've used bookshelf speakers. I used actually the uh, Pioneer Andrew Jones two point oh. Those are good speakers. Two point oh setup. Great speakers. Sure. For my home theater setup. However, I was at a crossroads. I had a crappy stereo analog receiver and I was doing analog sound out of my TV and just wouldn't work quite Oof. right. Things are getting funky with that. Like if I ran Spotify through a Chromecast, it wouldn't output audio. It's like a whole <laughs> bunch of weird shit. Because the TV didn't want to. I, on the analog I honestly have no idea. That was the only app I ever ran into, but it's one that I use a decent amount, so and weird. it was just kind of disappointing. So my options were to buy a new receiver, which I, I looked at, or replace the bookshelf speakers entirely. I went with the latter option based on Sebastian's recommendation of this soundbar, the YAS207. He heard this at an event recently that he was at, and he came away really positive about it and i decided to pick one up i bought mine on accessories for less for like 220 which is the certified refurb dealer it's not generally in stock but if you just set an email like they have a thing set an email alert on the page if you search for the model number that that's what i did they emailed me i ordered it right away and got it for a little less but 270 is pretty good it's on sale right now yeah uh you listen to this a bit at the office i did a little more digging with it and turned off some of the post-processing and it actually sounds 
really freaking good. It sounded like the processing was getting in the way when I heard it. Yeah. Here. yeah. So I figure out how to turn that stuff off. It has a bad phone app, like a like a really outdated phone app, which is annoying. Does it just do regular Bluetooth pairing and you just... Yeah. Like, does it do that? Okay. Yeah. Well, then you're not so worried about a phone no. app. Uh, so if you run in stereo mode without any of the enhancements turned on, it's great for stuff like watching TV and watching YouTube and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Okay. However... The DTS Virtual X virtual surround sound stuff is actually pretty awesome when watching movies. Okay. So it works pretty well. I have a, a pretty small living room, and I can actually get some bounce where it feels like sounds coming from behind me, where I definitely do not have the room for rear surrounds. My couch is pushed like up, up against, against the, the wall. wall. Yeah. It's just, it was never going to happen. Uh, and actually, it's, it's pretty cool. And the real scheme I have is that with the with the thing I put my TV on top of the piece of furniture mm -hmm. and the bookshelf speakers, I couldn't get a bigger TV because I was limited by space. Oh. Now I have a sound bar. Oh. I could get a bigger TV. Finally. So, so we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, one downside is that it has, it only has two HDMI ports. It has one for directly connecting a device, device and the other one is for uh, EARC, the audio return channel, yeah, which is just what I've been using. It doesn't support like e ERC or ARC won't support high end codecs, which the soundbar doesn't particularly do anyways. Mm. So like, I'm not trying to run Atmos through the soundbar because it doesn't support it. First of all, so <laughs> right, but it's it's all worked flawlessly. CEC and everything works really well with the TV. Like I have the shield and the TV and the soundbar, and I just wake up the shield and everything turns on and it's all it's it's right. And the shield con shield remote controls the volume of the sound bar. All it's all just worked. Cool. And for less than three hundred bucks, just it's awesome. The the it comes with a giant wireless sub that I have to turn way down because I live in an apartment. Mm. One day, one day I'm gonna turn that sub. One up. day. <laughs> so yeah, give all it right. a look. Cool. Uh, wait a minute. There are two links here? Just two yeah, different he places. hates pixels on both providers. I do. <laughs> but wait, I, I thought I opened both links, and it looks like it's the... Let's go with the Steam one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I go with the good old game. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. You pronounce that. <laughs> so, Terraria? Should this... Actually, let me back Terraria. up Terraria! Thanks, thanks for taking the Steam out. Thanks, guys. Well, I, he, I just... <laughs> he, 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 he. What? You told me to use the Steam one. No, no. I was talking about Jeremy. <laughs> oh. Jeremy. So, so anyway, I was going to go into this nice monologue about how all great audio gear is just one of the finer joys in life, but no, we're just going to cut right into it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so this game came out in 2011, and I didn't realize that it was actually one of the top-selling games of all time. I uh, picked this up for um, Christmas, actually, a Christmas gift on Steam, and got the, the four-pack for 30 bucks and gave it to a couple of my friends. They all hate me now. Um, <laughs> this has been a bigger time sink than Final Fantasy VII for me. Really? Wow. Yep. That's saying a lot. That's a statement. Yep. yep. No, I haven't actually reached that 180-hour point, but I fully expect to by the end of the month. It looks like <laughs> a pretty cool game. It's, it's super neat. It's very deep. Um, it was very surprising about how much depth an auto-generated world has. Um, it's quite entertaining, and especially for ten bucks, there is many, 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 many hours that you can get out of this. They've added a lot of stuff over the years. I imagine they're pretty much done with that now that it's a yeah, seven-year-old game. Like, they had a lot um, of content there. There was, I believe there's been three major revisions to it after it was initially released. Uh, the latest one was 1.3, uh, and there's been a couple minor revisions out. Um, and that was released in April of last year. And That's pretty impressive still. They're, they're, they've been working on Terra Otherworld, which has been kind of a, a cluster, it seems. But, yeah, they've over the years they've added a whole bunch more stuff to it. Um, Personally, I've just now stepped in the hard mode, which is about the halfway point, and I feel like a total noob. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Cool. It's Minecraft if it was an actual game. I, I don't get why people continue to compare it against Minecraft, because it's not the same thing at all. <laughs> it's not. They just can't, like, when Minecraft got really popular, it was about the same time that Terraria was out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're they're not they're not that yeah, similar, yeah. but it's a comparison people make all the time. So. 
Looks cool. I will have to avoid playing it because I actually am trying to get stuff done. I, I have an extra seat if you want one. Mm. <laughs> he has his own time sink in uh, I have to Factorio. Yeah. I, I haven't touched that in like a month or two. I've only touched it to maintain my mod for the community. <laughs> but that only takes like an hour or two when they make some update that breaks it or something. <laughs> All right, cool picks. Uh, so I'll wrap up the show. Uh, PCPro.com slash podcast where you will find this podcast and uh, show notes for it. And, and hopefully not any other podcasts. Hopefully uh, just this podcast. Well, we need all the previous editions of this, versions of this podcast and, fair, you know, stuff like that uh, and previous show notes and, and stuff. Uh, Twitter.com slash Ryan Shrout. Don't forget to uh, ping, the, ping the boss with random thoughts or whatever. And just no, make, hurry. make him scratch his head and wonder what the heck's going As on. As he's eating something really wonderful in San Diego. Or where are oh, we is at? Is that where he's at? I don't even remember. I don't know. I, I honestly can't keep track anymore. I can't keep track. I think anymore. it's Qualcomm something. Mm. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I did see some 5G tweets today. Mm, 5G? Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of Gs. Okay. Well, uh, anybody got anything before we go? 486 mm. forever. 486. 486SX. Uh, okay. Oh, that uh, DX stuff. <laughs> Yeah, SX for, for me. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, with that, I will uh, bid everybody a good night or a good morning if you're listening to this, not at night. Goodbye. Good night. Bye. Good night.